Live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. And welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host, Sonia Tagare, and we're live at Stanford University covering the fifth annual WIDS Women in Data Science Conference. Joining us today is Talithia Williams, who's the Associate Professor of Mathematics at Harvey Mudd College and host of Nova Wonders at PBS. Talithia, welcome to theCUBE. Happy to be here, thanks for having me. So, um, we ha you have a lot of roles, so let's first tell us about being an Associate Professor at Harvey Mudd. Yeah, I've been at Harvey Mudd now for 11 years, so um, it's been really a lot of fun. I'm in the math department, but I'm a statistician by training. So I teach a lot of courses in statistics and um, data science and things like that. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and you're also a host of a PBS show called Nova Wonders. Can yeah. Tell us more about that. Yeah, that came about um, a couple years ago. Folks at PBS reached out. Um, they'd seen my TED talk and they said, hey, it looks like you could be a fun host of this science documentary show. So um, Nova Wonders is a six episode series that kind of takes viewers on a journey of what the like cutting edge questions in science are. Um, so I got to host the show with um, a couple other co-hosts and really think about like you know what are what are um, animals saying and so like we got some really fun episodes to do what's the universe made of was one of them uh, what's living inside of us that was definitely a gross one to do but yeah, <laughs> fun to figure out all the different microorganisms that live inside our body so That's yeah so it's cool. been fun to, to host that show as well um, and do you talk about data science and AI and all that stuff on yeah oh yeah yeah um, one of the episodes can we build a brain was uh, um, dealt with a lot of data, big data and artificial intelligence and you know how good can we get, how good can computers get and uh, really sort of compared it to what we see in the movies. We're a long way away from that but it seems like you know we're, we're getting better every year at building technology that is truly intelligent. Yeah. And you gave a talk today um, about mining for your own personal yeah. data. So give us some highlights from your talk. Yeah, so that talk sort of um, stemmed out of the TED talk that I gave on owning your body's data. And it's really challenging people to think about how they can use data that they collect about their bodies to help make better health decisions. Um, and so ways that you can use like your temperature data or your heart rate data, or what does this data say over time? What does it say about your body's health? and really challenging the audience to get excited about looking at that data. We have so many um, devices that collect data automatically for us and often we don't pause long enough to actually look at that historical data. And so that was what the talk was about today. Like here's what you can find when you actually sit down and look at that data. Well, what's the most important data you think people should be collecting about themselves? Well, definitely not your weight, because <laughs> I don't want to know what that is every day. Um, it depends, you know, I think for women who are in the fertile years of life, taking your daily waking temperature can tell you when your body's fertile, when you're ovulating. It can, um, so, so that information could give women during that time period really critical um, information. But in general, I think it's just a matter of being aware of um, of how your body is changing. So for some people, maybe it's your blood pressure or your blood sugar. If you have high blood pressure or high blood sugar, um, those things become really critical to keep an eye on. And, um, and I really encourage people, whatever data they take, to be active in the understanding of and interpretation of the data. So it's not like if you take this data, you'll be healthy, and you know, you'll live to 100. It's really a matter of challenging people to own the data that they have and get excited about understanding the data that, that they are taking, so. Absolutely, Put, putting people yeah. in charge of their own That's bodies. That's right. That's right, yeah, yeah. And actually speaking about that, uh, in your TED talk you mentioned how you were, um, your doctor told you to have a C-section and you mm -hmm. looked at the data and you said, no, I'm going to have this baby naturally. So tell us more about that. Yes, you should always listen to your um, <coughs> medical professionals. But in this <laughs> case, um, I will say that it was, it was definitely more of a dialogue and so I wasn't, just sort of trying to lean on the fact that like, I have a PhD in statistics and I know data. It was really kind of objectively with uh, the on-call doctor at the time, looking at the data and talking about it. Um, and this doctor was, this was his first time seeing me. And so I think it would have been different had my personal midwife or my doctor been telling me that, but this person sort of only looked at this one chart and was, was making a decision without thinking about my historical data. And so I tried to bring that to the conversation and say like, let me tell you more about you know, my body and my, this is pregnancy number three, like here's how my body works. And I think this person in particular just wasn't really hearing any of that. It was like, here's my advice, we just need to do this. And I'm like, well, 
you know. And so as gently as possible, I tried to really share that data. Um, and then it got to the point where it was sort of like, either you're gonna do what I say or you're gonna have to sign a waiver. And we were like, I think we'll just sign the waiver. Right. Um, and so that caused quite a buzz in the, um, in the hospital that day, but we came back and had a very successful labor and delivery. And so, yeah, it was a good decision at, at the time. But, uh, you know, with that caveat that you should listen to what your doctor says. So. Yeah, I mean, there's really interesting, like, what's the boundary between, like, right. what the numbers tell you and, and what a professional tells you? That's right, because I don't have an MD, right? And so, you know, I'm cautious not to overstep that. Um, but I felt like in that case, the doctor wasn't really even considering the data that I was bringing. Um, I've, I was, we were actually induced with our first son, but again, that was more of a conversation, more of a dialogue. Here's what's happening. Here's what we're concerned about and the data to really back it up. And so I felt like in that case, like, yeah, I'm happy to go with your suggestion. But by kid number three, it was just like, no, this isn't really, yeah. Right. Um, so you also wrote a book called Power in Numbers, The yes. Rebel Women of Mathematics. So what inspired you to write this book and what oh do you hope readers gosh. take away from it? Yeah, a couple different things. I remember when I saw the movie Hidden Figures and um, I spent three summers at NASA working at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And so I, f I had this very fond connection to, you know, having worked at NASA and um, when this movie came out and I'm sitting there watching it and I'm like bawling, just crying and you know, I'm like, I didn't know that there were black women who worked at NASA like before me, you know? Um, and so it felt, it felt, uh, it was just so transformative for me to see these stories just sort of unfold. And I thought like, well, why didn't I learn about these women growing up? Like imagine had I known about the Katherine Johnsons of the world. Um, maybe that would have really inspired not just me, but think, you know, thinking of all the women of color who aren't in mathematics or who don't see themselves working at, at NASA. And so for me, the book was really a way to leave that legacy to the generation that's coming up and say like there have been women who've done mathematics um, and statistics and data science for years and there are women who are doing it now. So a lot of the, about a third of the book are women who are still here and like active in the field and doing great things. And so I really wanted to highlight sort of where we've been, where we've been, but also where we're going and the amazing women that are doing work in it. And it's very visual. So some folks are like, oh my gosh, women in math. And it's really like a very picturesque book of showing these beautiful images of the women and their mathematics and their work. And yeah, so I'm really proud of it. That's awesome. Yeah. And even though there there is like greater diversity now in the tech industry, yeah. there's still very few African American women especially who are part of this industry. So what advice would you give to those women who who feel like they don't belong? Yeah, well, A, they really do belong. Um, and I think it's also incumbent of people in the industry to sort of recognize ways that they can be advocate for women and especially for women of color, because often it takes someone who's already at the table to invite other people to the table. Like, I can't just walk up and be like, move over, get out the way, I'm here now. Um, but really being thoughtful about who's not represented and how do we get those voices here. And so I think the onus is often more on people who occupy those spaces already to think about how they can be more intentional in bringing diversity into those spaces. And going back to your talk a little yeah. bit, um, uh, how, how should people use their data? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, the ways that we've used our data um, have been to change our like lifestyle practices. And so, for example, when I first got a Fitbit, um, it wasn't really that I was like, oh, I have a goal. It was just like, yeah, I want something to keep track of my steps. And then I'd look at them and be like, well, gosh, I didn't even do anything today. And so <laughs> I think having sort of even that baseline data gave me a place to say, okay, let me see if I can hit 10 steps, you know, 10,000 steps in a day. Or, um, and so in some ways, having the data allows you to set goals. Some people come in knowing like, I've got this goal, I wanna hit it. But for me, it was just sort of like, eh. Um, and so I think that's also how I've started to use additional data. So when I take my heart rate data or my pulse, I'm really trying to see if I can get lower than how it was before. So the push is really like, how is my exercise and my diet changing so that I can bring my resting heart rate down? And so having the data gives me a goal to push toward and it also gives me that historical information to see like, oh, like this is how far I've come. Like I can't stop now, you know. That's a great social impact. That's right, yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. Um, do you think that 
so in terms of a per, like a security and privacy point of view, like if you're recording all your personal data on these devices, yeah. how do you navigate that? Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, because um, you are giving up that data privacy. Um, I usually make sure that the data that I'm allowing access to is sort of data that I wouldn't care if it got published on the cover of you know the New York Times. Maybe I wouldn't want everyone to see what my weight is, but. Um, and so in some ways, while it is my personal data, um, there's something that's a bit abstract from it. Like it could be anyone's data, as opposed to say my DNA. Like I'm not gonna do a DNA test. You know, I don't want my right. DNA to be mapped and out there for the world. Um, but I think that that's increasingly become a concern because people are giving access to the, of their information to different companies. It's not clear how companies would use that information. So if they're using my data to build a product or make a product better, you know, we don't see any royalties from that. We don't, you know, we don't have the benefit of it, but they have access to our data. And so I think in terms of data privacy and data ethics, um, there's a huge conversation to have around that. And we're only kind of at the beginning of understanding uh, what that is, yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on theCUBE. Really this was awesome, awesome having you here. Thank you, thanks for <laughs> having me, yeah. I'm Sonia Tagari. Thanks so much for watching theCUBE and stay tuned for more.